Welcome to Mini AMA. Um, we're, we're really excited to talk with you all today. We're going to get started in just a few minutes here. I have a couple housekeeping items. Um, if you've never been to an AMA before, welcome. Um, it's run by, it's put on by Ministar. We're the nonprofit community organization that is built to nurture and engage those interested in technology for meaningful connection. So we do that by, um, in the before times, a lot of the largest in-person gatherings in the Twin Cities and, and Minnesota. So Mini Bar, which is um, the largest and longest running tech unconference, um, which is a user generated conference. Um, Mini Demo, which is like our geek show and tells and today's event, which is in the AMA. So you will have the opportunity to ask questions live in real time from subject matter experts. And we're really, really excited for this lineup today. So I'm Maria Plussell. I'm the executive director of Ministar. Um, so what we'll, if you've never used Crowdcast before, um, welcome. <laughs> first thing first is that we will be taking your questions live. Um, so there's two ways that you can do that. Drop them in the chat at any time, which is on your right hand side, or you can use the ask a question feature. We'll be monitoring both of those. So you can use either one. Um, People are doing a really great job already introducing themselves in the chat. So we have Madonna and Tim and Tom, that Rick. Hey, Natasha. This is fantastic. Yeah, definitely introduce yourselves in the chat so that other people can know who you are and a little bit about what you do. Hey, Shelby, thinking about starting a side hustle. I'm pretty sure we'll cover some of that. <laughs> and hey, Jean. Hey, come on. Awesome. So what we are going to do, we're going to get started here. Um, and I'm actually going to pass it over to Jess, who's going to introduce herself and um, kick it over to our incredible panelists that we have. Um, we have a couple topics that will get the conversation rolling. But you're not going to be interrupting us. Drop your questions in at any time that they come up in the chat. And then um, we're going to get to those live um, after a few minutes. So Jess, why don't you take it away? Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. This is awesome. And I just love, love Ministar, love this community, and so grateful to have you all um, in this ecosystem or kind of be doing this work alongside a lot of you. But I'm Jessica Berg. I am the director of Minnesota Cup, which is a startup competition that is based at the U of M, um, specifically at the Home Center for Entrepreneurship at the Carlson School. And, um, but we are a, an early stage startup resource um, via our competition that is open actually to anyone in the entire state to apply to. And it gives me a wonderful opportunity and platform um, running Minnesota Cup to work with some incredible founders um, to continue to try to get better and better at helping people who have really good ideas or really big opportunities to get the resources and support they need to turn those into successful businesses if they want to. So. Um, I love conversations like this, and I'm super grateful to Jules, Brat, and Phil for, um, you know, sharing some of their experiences with you. They're all Min Cup alumni, but they have a lot of other experiences and perspectives. So, um, even though this is, you know, I'm I'm from Min Cup, like we're happy to navigate and big fans of a lot of other um, ecosystem organizations in the Twin Cities. So, don't hesitate to ask about other things besides Min Cup if you have questions about different programs. So. Again, thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna tee it up to the three of you and we'll go fill Jules Barat for intro so you know <laughs> kind of who's But I'd love for you to share with the folks tuning in um, just like a quick second about yourself and your background. And then um, the like a, a, like a 10 second overview of what your current business or startup does. And then I'll, I'll get into more depth with the next question. So um, Phil. You want to take us take us away? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name's Phil. I'm Phil Chow. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Homey. Uh, Homey is a helping platform that activates alumni in the recruiting process. Uh, we think that every community is a talent pool, and every alum is a node in that community. And so we've built a really great internal furl engine that lets uh, the recruiting process happen seamlessly. Uh, we started Homey in 2015, so we've been working on this for a while. And we've been full time on it for a while, uh, which is maybe a little different than kind of the traditional side hustle process. Um, we were just the nature of our platform as a as a consumer facing social platform. Um, we knew that revenue wasn't going to come widget by widget, and so um, we had to raise some some money early. Uh, we've raised about a million dollars to date, and that's what's gotten us to here. 
I mean, we're finally getting to this product market fit, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but I'm really excited to be here to share a story with you guys. Um, please do light up the chat. Um, I'll be watching every comment. I'll try to respond in the comments. Uh, but you know, thanks for all making time, and we're excited to be here. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. And it's nice to meet you, Phil, because I think this is my first time nice meeting to. you. Um, yeah, my name is Jules Porter. Um, so I am the founder of Sarah 7 Studios. It's a video game development company. We make video games for consoles. So that's Xbox, Nintendo, and PlayStation. Um, we also have an applied advanced Steam course uh, for 10th, 11th, and 12th graders that teaches them how to develop video games. So the whole goal is to get more BIPOC developers out there in the talent pool that are excellent and to prepare these kids for uh, careers where they can make $72,000, $80,000 a year entry level um, without a college degree. Um, I'm also a Marine Corps veteran, a proud Marine Corps veteran. Um, I'm a licensed attorney here in the awesome state of Minnesota, um, and this is my home state. So good to be here. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Hey, everyone. My name is uh, Bharat Pulgam. Um, I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Pickup. Uh, Pickup is an app that allows uh, neighbors in a neighborhood or an apartment building to find local stores that are already on the way to their neighborhood and create group deliveries and save money together. Um, started uh, my business when I was um, in uh, the freshman year at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we ended up getting accepted into the Target Techstars Retail Accelerator. Uh, I dropped out of school with my uh, two other co-founders and we've been full-time since uh, 2018. Uh, we also have raised about a million dollars in capital, um, and currently our team is about 15, uh, and we have an office in India. Um, so yeah, that's us. Cool. Well, thank you all for those intros. Um, you mentioned like little bits and pieces and flavors of this, but I will ask it more officially so that everybody, like, I love that you each have sort of different stories of how it how it started how long you've been full-time what that looks like for you but um if you don't mind just quickly in that same order going back to did one did this business even start out as a, a side hustle were you were you working on it for a while doing something else full-time or as a student and then um at what point or like how long into that tinkering or side hustling did you or how long did that take before you went full-time on it? Um, and Jules, you may have a different, like you are doing 14 million things at the same time, like right now while we're speaking. So hearing all <laughs> things and getting clarity on what, what that path was would be great before I jump into some of the other questions. Yeah, so uh, my, I, so I guess just some background. Um, I'm not from Minnesota originally. I grew up in California, Southern California, and I came to Minnesota for college. And when I got to college, it was a small liberal arts college in Northfield, Minnesota. And so not many, um, not many recruiters would go and hire people out there. And so the only way to get a job was to go and network. And I didn't really know what networking was. Um, and I think an upperclassman told me that you just had to email all these alumni in the alumni directory and ask them questions and hear their stories and figure out what you wanted to do. And if they liked you, they would refer you into the company. And so I did that and it turned into this incredible career adventure that you know, really informed what I do today. And I would say that the homie's mission is really to, to make that happen at scale, right? To make those opportunities available to everyone. And so you could say it started as a side hustle. Um, really, it was just, it was what the market needed. And I think that you know, with, with COVID and the virtual hiring world that we're in now, uh, it becomes even more important. So. Um, it's, I mean, a side hustle, you could definitely call it that, but um, I just knew pretty early on that I was really passionate about these relationships and that's what we're seeing being built on the platform. So hey everyone, and thank you for that, Phil. Um, so my company got started basically at the start of the um, social justice, I guess not the start, right? Cause it started so, so long ago, but the restart of the social justice crisis um, here in America and especially here in Minnesota. At the time I was a law student um, when the, we had the deaths of Jamar Clark um, and Philando Castile. And then of course um, we had Mike Brown over in Ferguson who was shot by the uh, police officer who testified that Mike Brown looked like a demon to him. Um, and that really stood out to me. Cause I was like, this teenager looks like a demon and that justifies to you why it was okay to shoot him. 
and for so many others, they that resonated with them and they um, also used that as a reason for justification. And that really bothered me. Um, and so I said, you know what, it's good to have laws that hold people accountable and changing procedure and putting things in place. We desperately need that. Um, but we need something more that's going to reach people's hearts. Um, and when I look at the media and how black folks are portrayed, especially in video gaming, we all are always villains. We're gangsters, thugs, mobsters, or reformed gangsters, thugs, and mobsters. We always have some level of moral deficiency, and it's very frustrating. You know, I have a young nephew, and we like to play video games together, but there's really no games where he can see himself as a hero in the games. So that also means that there aren't games where people outside of our community see black people in the games as heroes. Um, and so that kind of sparked a thing. I'm a huge video gamer, been a video gamer my entire life. I think video games can solve all the world's problems um, or at least get close. Uh, and so I said, you know what, instead of trying to work for a video game company as some kind of like intellectual property law attorney, perhaps I can put my skills together here in bo as both a law student and an MBA student um, to create something that's truly unique um, and that really uplifts the community. Um, and so that's what I do with my company. So. We are trying to change and build more empathy with showing more BIPOC characters um, who are positive um, and showing more nuance and kind of teaching some multicultural cultural competency. Um, but we are also making it so that, hey, now we can have more BIPOC tech talent that are excellent out there helping to develop video game and putting their imaginations in the world while also changing their economic outlook here in Minnesota. I think a black family of four makes about $31,000 a year median. Um, a native family, about $27,000 a year median. And you guys already heard me say, you know, entry level video game developer, $72,000, $80,000 a year. So this is really life changing for many of these kids, and we can break so many systems. Um, so that's what I do. The question was what taking the side hustle full time? Yeah, yeah. well, like, you're in a different where you still do multiple, like, full slash part time things, which, um, so you're yeah. living that life and just like how, I mean, I'll get into this with some of the next question, but how did you incrementally grow from an idea into this, you know, this space where you're, you're raising, and you're, um, you know, having this amazing iPhone women campaign and, and really growing the business while you're still doing other stuff. Yeah. So I mean, just it was, share it was a little hard. That's like, it was tough working as both a lawyer full time and also working on um, the video game company after work. I mean, that just means that I didn't get much sleep. So the Finnovation Lab has the Finnovation Fellowship, but all, which allowed me to step away from the law for about a year and work on the company full time. Um, and then once I got it to a great place and I was able to basically work on law stuff two days a week, and I still work on my video game company over 40 hours a week, but I do get more sleep and I'm, I'm much happier. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, Brett, how about you? Yeah. Um, so, um, my actually my first experience with Minnesota Cup was in high school. Uh, so I was part of the student division. So I had a startup prior to pick up. Uh, and then I, when I graduated high school in 2017, I was uh, at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I had another startup uh, to the side of that. So I was I was really inundated with a bunch of stuff. Um, and so pick up, um, you know, when it first began, um, uh, it was just like it was kind of like a dorm room thing. Like I was walking back in class and my buddy texted me and you know, I was like, yeah, I'll grab a burrito for you. And then three of my friends said, why didn't you grab a burrito for me either? So that was the thought. Um, so the entire idea was, you know, how can we connect people uh, in that way? But I, I think kind of tying in that question, like how did this kind of scale up to for us? Uh, the first like MVP of this, like very early on was just a Facebook group. And we identified that the Facebook group for our dorm was very, you know, there was a lot of demand for something like this. So then we ended up building an app. Um, and, you know, I started because I was still in school at the time. Uh, I started taking less classes. Um, and then eventually, once we got into tech stars, I, I kind of had to make a decision that, you know, uh, you know, what I did, I want to still stay in school um, at Carlson or, you know, drop out uh, and be part of the tech stars program. And that was an actual decision. They didn't really give me a choice. I had to drop out if I wanted to be part of the Techstars program. So that was kind of, it wasn't like, oh, you know, maybe I can do both. It was, you have to do this if you want that. And then actually later on, um, initially it was just a leave of absence. But when we ended up raising our first round, um, one of our lead investors said, hey, are you on a leave of absence or did you have you fully dropped out yet? And I said, leave of absence. I said, hey, I need you to tell me that you dropped out fully if you want this, want us to invest. So that was kind of how the full transition was made. Uh, same with the team. 
um, uh, kind of going from uh, part time to full time. Um, and yeah, I, I think I, I've never really held like a formal job like uh, for an other company before. Like it's always been like my own kind of thing. Um, so I definitely don't know the pain of working 40, 50 hour weeks and also trying to build a startup. But I have been, I did do school. I was doing a double major at Carlson. So if any of you are in school and thinking about, hey, how do I do my startup thing? You know, I can uh, hopefully be a resource for you there. But yeah, that's a little bit about my, my, my journey there. So that's awesome. So, I mean, it's cool to just have that grounding in where each of you are coming from, from that like side hustle slash, you know, um, full hustle perspective. Um, this would be a question for any of you that maybe have a perspective or, or something that resonates, but how did you, when did you get to the point where you knew you needed help or um, whether that was from your own, whether that's a time commitment thing and a capacity thing or a skill set thing, like maybe you're the technical founder, you have the tech skills yourself so you could you could code and you could like create platforms or maybe you were like, I've got the idea and I'm the idea person, but like I can't build this tech myself. Like where did you, when in your journey did you arrive at that point where you needed to bring other people along with you to help and what does that look like? So I uh, I would I'd love to say something here. Um, so for us, um, so I was actually really fortunate because I I didn't I was I was never like a single founder. I always had like our, it was it was a group of, it was a group of buddies. You know, we all kind of started to pick up together. Um, but outside of that, outside of the three of us, um, the moment when we started thinking about oh you know oh crap we need to we need to get more help uh, was when we started. Um, we, we had figured out what kind of that core loop was, you know, that user acquisition loop or the engineering loop or, you know, whatever that loop was. Cause I, I always, when I, even when I'm talking, when I've gotten some feedback, especially when we're early on hiring was, you know, hire someone either to figure out that loop or, you know, uh, to, to go do that loop for you. And oftentimes going and doing that loop for you is better. So for example, like you figured out what your core value proposition is and how to market it and you need someone to go do that better. Um, so that's kind of when we started looking for like our head of marketing and our head of engineering. Like we knew what we needed to build, but we didn't have anyone to build it yet. Uh, and that's when we started looking for additional help uh, in, in that sense. Um, there is a risk of like, I'm, I'm actually talking with someone right now and, uh, you know, she uh, built a built an app for like the social cooking, you know, app, which is really cool. Uh, but she like ended up giving away like 25% of her equity for this like venture studio to help her with engineering. And the issue there was that she didn't know what she needed to build yet. She didn't spend the time figuring that out. So she gave away equity to this company to build it for her. And now that company is kind of being sketchy and, you know, not doing their work. And anyway, point being is you as a founder should, should delegate work when you have yourself are rock solid in your understanding of the business, I think a lot of people get really excited and they like try to delegate work earlier on, but there's no, there's no, there's no problem in taking it slow and figuring it out the right way. Um, because there's a lot of value in that. Like we, we, you know, we learned the hard way. We, we raised money. We hired a bunch of people that we didn't really find product market fit yet. We got, we ran out of money. We fired a bunch of people. So, you know, for my advice to anyone out there would be really spend time on, um, you know, figuring out, you know, when you, what your business is, what the core of your business is before you take the next step to bring other people on board. Cause that like your, your co-founders are going to be the people that are going to, you know, be with you this entire journey and they need to be the right people. Um, so be very, 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 very particular and very, um, uh, don't give that co-founder title to just anyone. So that'd be yeah, that's, that's awesome. Would you, um, either like a different experience or adding on to what brought you, um, filler jewels, anything? No, I would definitely echo what brought you. Um, I think that, okay. you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just think that, um, Hugh's right. in so many things, right. I, one of the things I've learned um, is, especially at the earliest stages of the product, um, if you're not building it or selling it, then what are you doing? And, you know, I think we got in the trap of um, building a great culture. And, you know, because that's what we thought startups were supposed to be, great culture. And I think in Minnesota, startup culture, we, 
at least pre-COVID, uh, it was very much about getting together and having happy hours and pizza and all this stuff. And that really doesn't lend itself to product market fit in any capacity, uh, maybe to get some people to listen to you, your story or to try your product. But at the end of the day, um, that's the, the only thing that matters is if the market is willing to pay for your product. And that was just something that escaped us. And I think that when you ask, when did you realize you needed help? Um, I mean, we started as we started after graduation and we were all liberal arts majors. And luckily I had a technical co-founder who's a computer science major, but we were learning all of this on the fly. And I think, I mean, this was 2015 where there were resources online, but I don't think they're as plentiful now. Um, I don't think there were the same support networks and infrastructure um, back then. Um, and I just, like, I distinctly remember, um, I distinctly remember trying to fundraise in, in town and uh, just getting turned away from every investor, every single one. And it was it, very rightly so. I mean, we were, we had a couple hundred users on the platform. We had this idea for a consumer social platform. Um, and most of the investors in Minnesota are looking for like strong, stable revenue streams. They're not looking to build marketplace businesses. We didn't even know what a marketplace business was when we started Homey. Um, and I just, I think that that process of figuring it out, it, it does make sense to take it slowly. And if you are bootstrapping or if you are doing it as a side hustle, you have the opportunity to do that in a way that, you know, doesn't um, put other things in your life on hold. I mean, I think that's, uh, I wish I'd had that. But here we are. So. That's awesome. No, that's helpful. I mean, it's like, that's being able to share, you know, like, share the real parts of it and things you would do differently is so valuable for other folks. So yeah. appreciate yeah. the honesty with all of it. Um, how is that going for you now, Jules? And like, I don't actually, know, I know, I don't actually know right now if you, if you using any of this work or if you're still just like the solo superhero for Serif 7 Studios. Yeah, so, you know, making a video game takes so many different disciplines, right? Um, so it was great that I was a lawyer and I have a lot of the, the IP knowledge and all that stuff down. Um, but the thing that I was kind of most insecure about was perhaps like the art. You know, I wasn't, you know, much of an artist, even though, you know, I had the coding and that's cool. Like, you know, you can pretty much learn a coding language in about, you know, six months or so. Um, but the big thing with video games isn't necessarily a coding language. You have to learn the development engine, um, which which definitely takes much longer. So for me, it's the Unreal development engine that runs off of C++. Um, and so that's really cool. And so like I had to get past some of the things that were that were hanging me up, such as I was like, oh, I can't really move forward until I get an artist, right? When I realized it'd be really hard to get an artist um, for what I needed, I had to basically learn 3D modeling um, myself. Um, then I learned animation myself. Um, then I learned some more, so a little bit of cinematography myself, lighting, photography, a little bit of architecture so I can design things in the game. I just pushed myself to learn, I guess, all these different um, disciplines. Um, but yeah, I mean, right now I didn't expect to still be right doing this on my own. I mean, I have somebody helping me with like um, administrative assistant stuff, but what I really needed were like another developer or two or three. Um, but but that's really difficult because kind of like what these two gentlemen just said is I want somebody who's dedicated to my mission because I'm such a mission driven company. Um, but also here in Minnesota, we do have some independent people who work in video gaming industry, but we don't really have that depth of tech talent that you might find for video games as in like California or even in Montreal, Canada, which is where a lot of game developers are that are close by. Um, and so it's just been tough. And even finding people in the video game industry in Minnesota for like mentors or things like that has been extremely difficult. Like I was very fortunate to be connected with Glitch um, and that's really great. And Glitch is a big kind of indie game um, community and kind of an indie game uh, publisher or label, so to speak. Um, but it's a great hub um, for, for, for video game talent here. Um, but that only can take me so far. So yeah, that, that's where I am. But I, I actually... had to basically overcome Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Jules. Go ahead. I know you messed up my big finale. It's like we shall overcome. I had to overcome all my fears and learn how to do this stuff myself because I didn't have the money to hire somebody else to do it. So, so go ahead. I, I'd love to add to that. Actually, um, I, I really found it uh, awesome that you uh, mentioned that you learned how to code and you know you just kind of did it yourself. 
Um, I, I I think this is just a, like a quick backstory to us when we were first starting. So no one on my team was technical uh, when we when we began. Um, so we ended up raising money, and that was for hiring engineers. Um, and you know we we need we hired a designer because you know we didn't uh, we, we didn't we didn't have a lot of design skill. And basically, you know what ended up happening when we um, uh, you know we fundraised, we we were you know really everything's going great. We hired a bunch of people. But what ended up happening was that we, as the founding team, kind of lost touch with, um, you know, some of the things that were happening either with the app or with marketing because we fundamentally didn't have an understanding of what those things were. Um, and you know, also just just because you know we were 18 at the time, you know, you know that makes sense. But um, you know, at, what ended up happening was that you know when 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 things really got rough and we ended up firing you know most of our team and you know just trying to stay alive. Um, uh, you know, eventually last year. Uh, not 2020, but 2019. Our our our, our head engineering uh, head of engineering quit. Um, so you know we we didn't have any engineer. The app slowed down. So you know I was like, all right, you know, uh, co like team, we're gonna figure this out. So you know, uh, you know, Sam took a took a bit to a huge course on product marketing. I, I started learning how to program. Uh, you know, Josh started learning SEO and optimization. And I, I, I kid you not, we're doing more month to month growth right now, just the three of us and our team in, of engineers in India, than we did when we were burning like forty five, fifty thousand dollars a month on this like cool team that looked cool but wasn't actually doing anything. So you know, any of you like, don't be a. There is no shortcut to learning the hard skills. Like, you know, you don't need to learn everything, right? But like now that I, now I can go in and if I'm talking to our engineering team, you know, I can be like, hey, this isn't done right. Like why, why is it not done right? And I at least have the knowledge to speak to them about that. Where, where prior, prior, like someone could be like, oh yeah, I'm working on this feature. It's taking me four weeks. And I wouldn't be able to, you know, understand why or how, or, you know, and they're still getting paid, you know, $10,000 a month. So, you know, definitely invest time in learning the basics, you know, like make sure you understand like some of the marketing things and some like product man. If you're building an app, product manager, or if you're building an engineer, like engineering, or, you know, software, or computer programming, um, and you know, those are the kind of skills that will make sure that you will be successful in the future, uh, especially as the co like the co-founder, um, you know, because you can always find people to to special that are specialized in that to go and do the things that you need to do better. Uh, you know, I, I do believe like you should, if you're, you know, you should try to be the dumbest person in the room, you know, but at the same time, uh, you know, you should also be able to take over and, and lead all of those product directions when you need to. So um, don't if you look for a co-founder when you really need the help off of a process you've already built. Don't look for a co-founder if you're trying to, you know, get away from some kind of work that you need to do or you don't have skills in it. Because before you do that, you should learn that skill. Uh, it'll save you a lot of money, a lot of heartache. You know, you'll understand your business better. The whole, whole, whole deal. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That's Joel, awesome. It's awesome that you learned all those things. That's, that sounds crazy hard. Uh, so applaud you for that. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think all that was super helpful. And I'm just trying to be thoughtful about time and noticing some of the, the Q&A rolling through. So please, for folks who we are getting close to the time where you'll have the floor, like I have like 14,000 follow up questions I could and would love to ask because I think all of this is super interesting, but want to make sure that those of you who are tuning in have a chance to drive the conversation too. So start drop in your questions in the chat or the ask a question feature and Maria will be kind of jumping in back in with us to be facilitating that part. But um, a question related to like, we've talked about, you know, how long you stayed si a side hustle before you were full time, um, which Jules is still not even yet slash she works more than full time to like do all the things she's doing, which is so dope. Um, and a lot of people are in that situation. We talked a little bit about like how you like the the pros and cons and like misadventures of when you brought in outside talent versus things that you just continued to own or be the expert of yourself, which I think is so helpful and not something people are on often honest about of like, yeah, I screwed this up, actually, like I would do it in a different order in the past. So that's super cool that you guys shared that. Um, I think some folks have asked questions about and I if I didn't like from a min cup leadership standpoint, ask you um, which things did you do in which order to help support you, whether that was with um, educational expertise, with getting connected to mentors and supporters early. Um, this is even pre fundraising. Like it's so dope that you have been able to successfully raise funds um, 
through different channels. But before you were even at a place where an investor or like a crowd crowd raise was in, in your future, what did you participate in? What, you know, what would you recommend that other folks look into? Um, I know you all are MinCup alumni, but you've done other things besides MinCup. So Jules talked about Finnovation Fellowship and then she did MinCup. Um, what what was that journey for for Phil and brought to? That's a good question. I can go, Phil. Or yeah, go yeah. go for Brad. Go for okay. it. Um, unless you have an answer. <laughs> no, I need to think on it. Okay. All right. All right. Um, yeah, I, I, have, I have like a stack of resources that I've, I'm, I'm ready to share all the time. So uh, Beta MN is amazing. Uh, if you guys aren't part of those events, uh, you know, that is actually where you might potentially meet a future co-founder. Uh, mm -hmm. If you if you haven't been part of those events already, please go check those out. Uh, Generator uh, has a lot of like free accelerators that are like, I think, like two to three months long. Uh, that are specific to verticals. Uh, so that's also fantastic. Uh, Target Takeoff, uh, they have different programs around like beauty and health and wellness. And like if you're like working on like a CPG, uh, Target's really great uh, for that kind of stuff. Uh, Forge North, uh, forgenorth.com, I think. They have a bunch of resources that they'll compile like for like every startup th resource. So uh, go check them out. For me, um, I... So because I was in school, uh, and if any of you are in school, I highly recommend you do this. Uh, use your school domain email address and just start reaching out to people you think are interesting. Uh, so when I was in high school, I uh, I sent an email to like the CMO of Best Buy and he got together with me. And then, uh, you know, my prior startup didn't, uh, you know, my prior startup's closed now, but uh, he ended up, you know, helping me close my round for pickup. So do a lot of that, like, on the ground networking, that's the type of stuff that'll help you uh, when you go to build your startup. So that's me. Yeah. Well, just, uh, I wanna like follow back up with your sort of clarify, <laughs> you've done so many different programs uh, across different startups, but which did you, what order did you do them in? Like, were you, I know, I mean, you competed in Minnesota Cup like four times, like across all these different <laughs> yeah. experiences, but <laughs> you think, certain ones are better for people with idea stage or early stage versus yeah. when you're more long or more mature. I think, I think, uh, to like, if you're really just starting out, I think, uh, generator is fantastic, uh, because they will like, if you're like, just like, like if you're like four weeks into your idea and you're like, just need some help and you're like a solid founder, they'll get you in. And then after generator, I would do min cup. Cause I think generator is going to force you to get a business. Then you go to min cup, you know, you continue to build, uh, you you get attached to mentors, you get more experience in that way. Um, and then, uh, can you still hear me? I lose my we video. We can hear you. Your camera oh. situation went away, but you're still Weird. here. Okay. I'll, I'll try to figure that out. Uh, but yeah, Minnesota, Minnesota Cup. Um, after Minnesota Cup, you know, Beta MN is going to give you a lot of exposure um, to like potential customers. So I think that was fantastic. And then like once you're past that, TechStars is great. Uh, like if you're really at like a stage where you're ready to start growing, accept real, you know, VC capital, uh, TechStars are, you know, th that accelerator program is fantastic. So yeah, I would kind of think about it in, in that way. Um, regardless, don't pay any money. Don't give up any equity to any accelerator, any investor, any competition, uh, uh, you know, until you get to like your, you know, either have a pilot revenue generate, like you, there's a lot of free resources out there. Do not waste your money or equity on uh, organizations that are taking it from you until like there is your legit or that's legit. So 100%. Yeah. That's, I mean, what, the, what he said is so right. And he gave a great list of local organizations, but I mean, the internet is your best resource, right? You, you can find anything you need to know on the internet. Um, and you're gonna run into advisors or people who just want points for putting their name next to you. And you know, maybe this person has had one successful exit 20 years ago, right? It doesn't mean that that person is the best person to help you build your business, right? So to seek out the founders who have, um, and especially for you know entrepreneurs who are um, just starting off, um, potentially by like coming out of school, I think there's also this identity crisis where you know our society has you know put founders on this pedestal, and um, you're encouraged to engage in a certain way and be a certain person or sleep <laughs> a certain number of hours a night. And I just I think that that's um, it's incredible. It's incredibly stressful, and to have someone who's done it before to walk you through it. Um, and to ha even have a support network of those people is huge. So, um, yeah, I just, I would, 
I would just caution you not to build the business you're supposed to build and build a business that, um, you know, that you want to build that makes you happy. But w when, I mean, you, could you share a little bit about what you did access, like a, apart from the internet for, for homey? Yeah, um, I actually- uh, Your I, side hustling, I, did you do certain things or when you were full-time, did you compete or participate? Something that was powerful for me, and we've been full-time with homey since the get-go, right? And we were able to raise incremental amounts of um, angel capital to just get us through the process. Um, I think that like one of the most impactful things for me was actually um, moving to the Valley for a while, right? I spent nine months in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, and I was able to, to meet some of the nodes in that network. And uh, I met a scout from Kleiner Perkins um, named Thompson, who was, I think he, he, he led uh, data science for Square um, and he just, he liked us. And you know, he, he believed in us enough to um, get us into the scout program at Kleiner. And that was huge for us. It, it put us into this, this network of VCs that just like, I mean, these no, the, 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 the kinds of companies they've built and the, the value add that they bring is just incredible for the kind of business we wanted. And so, you know, I, I just think there's a lot of value in stepping out of your comfort zone. And, you know, there are a lot of tried and true programs. Um, those work for a lot of people, but, you know, some sometimes you have to venture outwards and, and see what's out there. Yeah. So one thing I kind of want to... Oh, go ahead. You go. <laughs> one thing I just kind of want to speak on it when it comes to uh, fundraising and, and building equity is that you do have to kind of be realistic about who you are and how people view you. So for instance, I'm a black woman. So we all know these stats, right? Is I think the first three years of a company, a, a business founded by a white guy is able to raise about $1.2 million. A business founded by a, like a black woman, maybe about $32,000. Um, so there's there's definitely an inequity there. I actually had a friend who, um, who I saw works at a, a VC firm now. So I gave him a call just to say, hey, this is what my company is. What do you think I can do to kind of you know, get ready to, to speak to investors. And he basically said, you know, my company has never founded a black woman company. You have to compete with like white guys and Asians. Like he was very straight up um, and he didn't care, I guess, about um, anything PC. But uh, but yeah, he, he was just very, very honest about how the VC world kind of views things. So that's difficult. And we just had, I think at the very start of 2021 or just at the very end of 2020, the first black woman who raised a million dollars for a company in Tennessee. Um, and so that's crazy that we're still I don't even know, probably Minnesota, I'm hoping there's been a black woman company that's raised over a million dollars, but I really don't know of one. Um, and so it's just that difficulty. And despite all the figures that, that I told him and shared with him about the video game company and about like, for especially for a mid-tier game, the average you know, revenue after the first year of launch is between you know, 30, $30 million and $300 million. And he was still like unmoved because he's like, oh, it's so untested. So just finding people in the video game industry here in Minnesota who kind of understand those basic numbers is difficult. Um, and then finding where to go to find those folks. I mean, I'm guessing somewhere in California, you know, it's still for me is very difficult because I'm not naturally connected to those circles. Um, and I don't really know how to get connected to those circles, despite um, many, many attempts and, and many, many, you know, networking um, tries and opportunities. So so, so for some people, it's just a tad harder and just know that and, and don't give up, you know, keep, keep moving forward. Jules, from like a program standpoint, do you want to give like a baby shout out or like a, a, like the order of operations you used between Finnovation Fellowship and then Min Cup after that? Sure. I actually went from, I hear a little bit of an echo. I actually went from um, University of St. Thomas because I was already in school for my MBA. And St. Thomas has a follower competition there. Um, so basically they had a business concept challenge that I participated in and I won and I was so uh, surprised. Everybody was surprised. I was like, what? Um, and then I did the business uh, plan challenge, which was great. So I went from developing my ideas and then in the spring, and that was in the fall, then the spring I went to really developing my business plan. Um, and then from there I, in, I entered the Minnesota Cup. Um, and then I think probably after a year or maybe two years ago, maybe a year after the Minnesota Cup, then I did the Finnovation um, Fellowship so I could further develop, you know, my company, my idea, my business plan and just, just everything and get that mentorship. Because I realized I had a lot of mentors in the legal field. Um, and then with the MBA program, there were some mentors there, but they weren't like entrepreneurs. Um, and so it was great just to develop a network of entrepreneurs um, that I can toss questions around to and, and everything like that. So, yeah. 
that's about kind of how I how I did it. And I and I've done Minnesota Cup I think every year since the Innovation Fellowship. So yeah, I'm still I'm still trying. <laughs> it took us four times. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Was it three? Or four? Oh, Maria, do you want to like just give us a like an update on how Q and A is looking so we have time yeah. to get questions All answered? Right. So we have about 15 minutes left. So definitely um, now is your chance. Drop your questions in the chat here. Um, we did have one come up um, that um, brought, I know you you mentioned, you responded to it, but I, I wonder if the rest of the group wants to respond. So Nick had a question around, does anyone have any recommendations or referrals on finding a consultant on database and app tech stack? I'll plug Modern Logic. They're fantastic. Um, I we were one of their first clients. Um, they they're just a great group. They're not going to charge you a bunch of money. Um, I, I love working with them. So Modern Logic, check them out um, regarding database and app tech stack. If you just need a consultant on you know what what technologies to use, um, yeah. Yeah. Any any other recommendations from the rest of the group? Modern Logic is awesome. Um, we, yeah, we've never done, um, it, we've never brought in external consultants, but I do know Jeff Lynn uh, from Bust Out Solutions mm -hmm. quite well personally, and I can speak to his character and um, yeah. just an incredible founder. One thing I do want to mention to anyone that's planning on doing like a technical app or a technical, you know, whatever, um, this is one of my re biggest regrets is please do not go and try to raise money or spend a lot of money on your first app. Um, like get an MVP out. Uh, I, our first MVP was literally a Facebook group. Like you do not need like, like MVP is sometimes some people call it MLP and like, I hate all the acronyms too, but like minimum lovable product. It doesn't even have to be viable. It just needs to be lovable. Like, can you get to point A to B? Right. So there's some great tools like bubble.io. It's a no code tool. You can build an entire system for like $9.99 a month. And like, that's all you, like, it's just you, right? Uh, there's Glide. Uh, you can build an app from like a Google spreadsheet. It's crazy. Uh, our merchant platform for like, we have over a hundred merchants, including Target and like uh, Whole Foods and Aldi. They, it's still no code. Like, <laughs> you know, we're, we're generating revenue. We're positive cash flow. We've raised a bunch of money. Great. We're still on a no code platform. So do not like a lot. I think a lot of people are like a lot of people get sucked into that where they're like, oh, I need to raise a bunch of money to go hire engineers and then go build out this crazy app. Your crazy app's not going to exist if you don't know what the, like, the initial app's going to be. And like, I wish we would have just built a website because like that's what I knew how to do, built a website and just like tested it out for a month because mm -hmm. a lot of the assumptions we spent a ton of money on, like like literally half a million dollars on the app has completely changed, you know, like it's completely changes. You're always going to be wrong. You're never going to be right. So please do not <laughs> spend money on an expensive app very early on. Go to a no code tool, build what you can. You're going to save a lot of money and you're going to validate your app in a fantastic way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just, that this brings up something that you all spoke to a little bit. But I think in some ways we can connect it back to resources or to your own hustle and your own, you know, willingness to try stuff and be wrong, which is like the magic of entrepreneurship um, across the board is spending that time and being rock solid on what you, what's unique and sort of what your own value proposition is. And then validating like do people actually want this or am i just like is this a super cool idea that i think is sweet and i haven't been able to prove that anybody else cares and then two um once you're proving some of those things out like do they care enough about it to actually pay you money for it and like it is bananas with it i mean it's it's fair and like minnesota cup exists as a process to like invite in people and help walk help people walk through that process and figure it out while you're competing with us, but you would be blown away by how many people just come into the process and they say like, well, I just know that people need this because I just think they do. And like, if you can't demonstrate that people really want it besides just your own idea or your immediate family, like that's not enough. And like, you're, you're, you're right, but if you if you can take some of those steps to prove it out and validate what people really want and, and even get the features right before like brought and Philip shared to like before you go down a rabbit hole and spend a bunch of money or code something and then find out that, oh, like they actually want this, not 
like the heartache you will save is massive. <laughs> One thing I just want to say really quick, I know I'm talking a lot, but there's, a, I, I've learned this, like th this is what I've been learning the last few months at least is that like, it's not necessarily about the quality of execution. It's the speed of execution because you will always be wrong. And so one of my mentors was like, hey, whatever you think you're going to do, cut it into 50% and test that because whatever you're going to put out there is going to be wrong. That 50% of the 50% that you put out there, take what's built there that's right and continue to build on that. Because like you can spend an entire month building this beautiful feature, but if it's not in front of customers, you're not going to get anywhere. So like yeah. get stuff out there, get in front of your customers, like like push, 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 you know, always be building, always be launching things. Because that's what that's the only way you're going to learn. You know, you should go into this knowing that you're probably your fundamental assumptions are probably wrong, and that you need to test them. Out, so, Jessica, Jessica, you actually mentioned something really interesting, and I think it, uh, like as a founder, it's uh, it takes a lot to to basically take an idea and bring it to market. It takes a lot more when you have the whole world telling you it's a stupid idea, and then on when you compound that with um, you know, bills that need to be paid and all these things, it just makes this process really, really hard. Um, and then there's these unforeseen market conditions, right? I don't think any of us would have predicted the the shutdowns or the pandemic or things like that. Um, and, you know, with Homie, like, and Brown might be able to relate to this, but we'd been grinding on this for so long. And it sometimes it felt hopeless. It was like, we know that this is how the new generation wants to find work, how they want to build relationships, how they want to figure their lives out. Um, but, you know, we're not able to get this traction on the product and, you know, you know, the incumbents aren't willing to try new technology. Like, what do we do? And we slogged it out for five years, just limping along until all of a sudden, right, you have this mass adoption of virtual hiring technology where every company needs to lean in. And I just, I think that we were able to limp along long enough to, for Gen Z to effectively enter the workplace. And that, I mean, I don't that wasn't the plan, right? We were just trying to trying to get to trying to get to revenue and product market fit and all of those things. But in that process, right, you tested a bunch of hypotheses, and now we're in the space where everyone is entering it. But we've been thinking about this problem for the last five years, and and it puts us at a really interesting advantage. So um, I don't really know what the point was with that, but I just <laughs> <have> experience. <laughs> No, I, I'm tracking. I think like you're sharing a counterpoint to that. The Like also people who are innovators and who have big ideas and do want to create something new that's never existed. There is this opportunity and sometimes the biggest opportunity is to like build something that people don't know they need or want yet. Yeah. Or where like maybe you have a small group of like people who are diehard like followers, believers, but you can't break through that like, you know, exist stack of incumbents or people who are like well like there's so much sunk cost in doing it this way so like why would we pivot um so yeah you i mean you're just sort of giving a really powerful counterpoint to what i shared about like there is a certain razor's edge you walk between if you're going to try to start and like be financially viable soon you have to figure out like how can you start out and, and get money from customers um but like baby step towards what the ultimate goal and vision is too yeah not, sure. lose sight, not let people influence you away from the big thing. Yeah. And I'm not saying not to listen to feedback, right? We're definitely guilty of not listening to people as well, just like being too arrogant or, you know, hard headed. Um, but like, it's not that the COVID happened and our product just magically worked, right? We, we continue to pivot. We continue to, to iterate and to build on it. And we just happen to be um, in the right place at the right time. Yeah. What would right. you say to that, Jules, too? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Maria. I'm like... Before we... Um, I want to make sure we get to Jean's question, um, because Jean asked this early on, and I appreciate your patience, Jean. Um, so it's a two-part question. So the first question is, what areas really impacted you in the startup of your business in, let's say, like the first 18 months to two years? And then the other part of it, which we've touched on a little bit, um, was what would you say about finding mentors? So I would I'd say I think 18 months to two years, we can remember that awesome time of grinding um, and then the finding mentors piece. Um, Jules, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm all about mentors. My mentors are absolutely fantastic. And once somebody becomes my mentor, I keep them for years upon years. So 
Um, no, even though a lot of my mentors aren't in the video game industry, um, there's still people that are experienced with other things that were so able to help me. So one of my mentors um, started a Collectivity. His name is Scott Cole. He's amazing. Um, <laughs> and he just was able to help me with so many different um, questions that I had on the financial piece, on the financial side. And it's just so great walking through um, the things, you know, my questions with somebody who's just super smart. And that's for many of my mentors. One of my mentors, um, she does, she's a patent attorney at 3M. Um, and so it was just great, you know, chatting with her about different IP issues that I kind of foresaw with video gaming. Um, another one of my, my mentors is kind of like a financial advisor um, specifically. Um, and it was so great um, talking about just equity versus um, other things that I could do. And so we kind of came up with a model of um, providing royalties to the first game. Because if each game can sell about $30 million to $300 million, instead of trying to give up equity in my company, what about giving up you know, some royalties uh, per game? Um, for certain amounts and so just being more creative um, and just thinking more flexible uh, flexible was, was really amazing for me and the first 18 months in my company it was really about so much market research as we kind of talked about before that's why i kind of put that comment in there's like yes um, because i realized that with my pitch it wasn't just about hey we have this problem right with you know black people being gangsters mobsters thugs only and we have this problem with 80% of black youth playing video games but only 3% of the video game working industry are black, native, or Hispanic, uh, which is ridiculous. And how do we fix that? But it's also, I have to educate the people that I'm talking to about the video game industry so they can understand the potential. A lot of people don't know that it's bigger than television, it's bigger than film, and it's bigger than sports worldwide. Um, they kind of just, I guess, picture 20-year-old kid in his parents' basement eating Cheetos and not understanding how that translates to like just so much money. Um, but just explaining that to them, explaining emerging markets, you know, getting out of their minds that the video gamer is basically a 20 year old white guy and letting them know the average video gamer is a brown skin 35 year old guy um and like 46 percent of the industry globally are, are women um and just kind of taking some of those stereotypes people have and, and, and changing them so it took a lot of market research and then a lot of pitching a lot of practicing so i practiced my pitch and my presentations in front of people from all different industries all different walks of life so i could see what their natural questions are or were so that I could just go ahead and answer that right in my presentation. So they're not sitting there thinking about this at the very beginning, like, wait a second, that stops them from paying attention to what I'm saying. Um, and just that practice, you know, I think made me a, a pretty good presenter at the end of it. Yeah, I want to plus one to that practicing your pitch, you know, and, and plug a couple. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, some avenues that are completely open, no matter where you are in your idea or project, um, One Million Cups, um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, is a great place for newbies, anyone, to be able to kind of test out a pitch and get some real-time feedback. Um, we run Mini Demo that is completely open. You don't have to have a company. You don't have to have anything. And we do a lot of um, pitch prep. Um, and how does a demo pitch differ from a business pitch, right? Um, and there's just there's a lot of groups around town, but I definitely wanted to highlight those two as, as options um, because I think it's incredibly, incredibly important. Yeah, thanks for dropping that in there, Jess. Um, yeah, Barat and Phil, anything you want to add to that? No, I think you guys did a really good job covering it. Yeah. Well, I'm going to just be bold and throw in some Min Cup related plugs while you know if you all want to think about like maybe one last comment or something that you'd share offer up to folks um, who are watching but minnesota cup is accepting applications right now they're open for another approximately two weeks or if you're watching this late they're due on um friday April 16th and we are like like others mentioned we are um, open to very very early stage or even idea stage founders and innovators so the vast majority of people participating in our project or our competition are um, or applying are not full time on their business yet. It is a side hustle or it's just a vision or something they'd like to maybe become their full time hustle in the future. But they need that connectivity and those resources and to build up a network for themselves and get feedback in a supportive place or supportive format. So highly, highly encourage you to apply um, and also. Um, We've got a ton of resources and a supportive space to get help. So I'll throw some min cup links into the chat as well. If you haven't heard of us or you're, you know, looking for that first 
support organization to get some um, connectivity. We'd love to be that for you um, if it fits, but um, yeah, we're huge fans of truly all these other amazing groups in the ecosystem that, that have been mentioned so far. Um, so we love we love being collaborative and, and partnering and like referring people across each other's programs. So um, shout out to all of the amazing, mostly women who run <laughs> uh, the startup support ecosystem works. Um, yeah, one thing I just want to add, yes, I dropped a link in there um, to um, a blog post we did a while ago, um, specifically for if you are doing a it's a lot of it can be applicable to no matter what kind of pitch. Um, but if you have maybe a technical product and you have some of those questions around like, how do I, you know, show versus tell, um, that's a good resource for you. Um, do our presenters final on time? Oh, or, do you want to um, plug anything? Is this? Oh, oh, oh you mutuals. Am I still muted? You're good. Okay. Now I was asking, are, are you asking, did you ask for last thoughts or did you ask a different question? Yeah. Yeah. And la any last thoughts, anything you want to plug? Yeah. So I do have, I, I want to leave you guys with two quotes. One of my favorite quotes is uh, be patient. Nothing in nature blooms all year. And you know, so just be patient with yourself. And even like, you know, our world champion, you know, athletes, they take an off season, right? And so just know that you're gonna have some days. Um, and then the other part is uh, my favorite quote by Archimedes, uh, which is give me a place to stand and a fulcrum and I shall move the earth. Um, and so that's just like, you wanna make a meaningful impact when you do show up, when you're in your season, um, but you also wanna show up with the right tools. So an Archimedes needed a fulcrum. So make sure you have the right tools uh, to, to get moving, whatever you need to do, so, but don't, don't give up and be patient with yourself. Love that, love that. Um, how about Phil? I think that, I, that that's a great, great place to wrap. That was, that was great. <laughs> no, yeah, that's uh, beautiful. <laughs> you know, I, I feel very lucky to be here. I really do. And you know, we've been one of the more public startups, um, which also means we've been public with our failures. And you know, I, I think that you know, at the end of the day, if if those failures are you know lessons for you and you can learn from them, then awesome. I feel like it was uh, worth it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, like, I feel very fortunate. I think uh, Thomas shouted this out. It's like, if you do something you love, then you don't really feel like you're working. Um, like, I, I just feel blessed to be in this position and um, we're just going to keep grinding. So, and I, I wish you all the best of luck in your ventures as well. Awesome. Barat, anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, my favorite quote, also uh, pull a quote out, uh, believe in yourself, everyone else will catch up eventually. Uh, that's that's gotten me through pretty, some pretty hard days. So uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, stick to the basics, guys, you know, uh, focus on what the, you know, the zeros and ones, there's a lot of noise out there. You do you, you know, like, don't, don't get distracted. Just you do you, you know, what's best for you. And you know, what's best for your business. So uh, yeah, that's my advice. Good luck, everyone. And I uh, hope you all have the best of success uh, in whatever you're building. This is fantastic. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank Jess. Uh, also, just side note, I don't think that we've ever wrapped with like in such a philosophical way and just like in such a beautiful way. Usually it's like, I'm hiring or I'm like plugging like things like that. So shout out to all of you for having inspirational quotes at the ready. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you all. Um, and some we hope to see you some deep stuff. These are some beautiful thoughts. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you around the next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks Thank for putting us together.